I don't know if you caught this, but we, we celebrated two incredible things this morning, both that deal with mandates that God has given to believers, to people uh, who, call, who, who uh, he created and loved. Uh, the first one we celebrated this morning was to see those parents dedicating themselves and their children to the Lord. Wasn't that a beautiful thing? Did anybody here like to see babies? I love that other people have babies. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I remember there was a time when I thought we will never get out of the diaper stage. And we are out of the di- Megan, where are you? Amen. We're out of the diaper stage, right? Amen. I'm so grateful for that. Um, I'm so grateful for God adding to these families and adding to our church. And church family, like we've already said, we have a responsibility, don't we? to these families and to all the children that we have in our church, the student ministry, everybody to help, help these families do the task that God's given them to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What we see in those children being added to those families is an, an obedience to what many call the dominion mandate that's found in Genesis chapter one. I'll put that verse on the screen. This is what God said. It says, so God created man in his own image In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Man, there's a lot that we could say about that verse, isn't there? There's a lot that our culture needs to understand about that verse. First of all, we were designed and made and created by God. Uh, Creation is his idea. There's design in the universe and he created. He also created us male and female. And, And both male and female human beings are created in God's image in a way that um, that all the rest of creation is not. It's clear from Scripture that every person is valuable from conception and made in God's image. And so human life ought to be protected. And I'm going to take this, this the point of this sermon is not a, not a point for life, but I want to say, last week, thank you for taking the signs we have out in our lobby, a place for you to get signs to, that, that promotes voting no um, for the proposition number one, that's happening on November 7th. I've been watching the lies and the advertising that, call, that, that says that if this proposition is not passed, then women won't be able to get care after a miscarriage and that abortion is health care for women. Voting yes for this will make abortion legal through nine months of pregnancy. It's awful and you should vote no on this moral issue. This is a moral issue, not a political issue. This is a moral issue and you should vote no uh, on November 7th. If you want to know what you should vote no uh, or why you should vote no, there's out, out on, the, on there. The actual full text of the proposed amendment is there, and there's some commentary that gives you, walks you through. And so if you have any questions, come see me. And if you disagree, we love you. We're glad you're here, um, but, but we're not going to agree. Um, God cares about life. Amen. We're made in God's image, and uh, that's awesome. It says in verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful. And what's the next word? Say that real loud. Hey, you got it. God told them to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. And it says, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You see right here from the beginning, a command for human beings to multiply. Today in our child dedication, we see these families pursuing that mandate to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In the, be- in the beginning, God's plan was multiplication. Be fruitful and multiply. Kids aren't a curse. Kids are a blessing. Kids aren't a problem. Kids are a gift. And wasn't that a beautiful blessing to see that? And then, of course, we also saw today somebody get baptized. Little Draven got baptized today. This was obedient to a second mandate that God gave. God commanded us to make disciples of all nations. And in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, this is also up on the screen, it says this, Go ye therefore and teach, Matthew 2, Sate, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world Amen. We saw that part of the process today. This Draven believed in Jesus Christ. He is not going to heaven today, according to the Bible, because we dunked him in our water tank. Okay? 
The water that's up there is not holy water. It's Finley City water. We paid for it, okay? Um, it, it, there's nothing magical about the water. What happened today is that Draven, at some point in the last little bit, understood his own sinfulness. You say kids are sinful? <laughs> Anybody ever been a parent, right? Kids can sin, and their sin means that they have to get right with the Lord, just like all of us. If you're not a sinner, raise your hand. <laughs> Correct. Nobody in here. Whoever raised their hand's a liar, right? <laughs> because we're all sinful, and our sin is not something we get to define or we get to say is a certain weight. God says it, and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life, it says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He came down and lived a perfect life. Born of a virgin, he didn't have any sin nature. He wasn't given a sin nature handed down to him by Adam. He, he lived a perfect life, and when he died on the cross, he, he died taking the wrath of God for our sin. That's what we sang about in the song in Christ alone, that, that God poured out his wrath on Jesus so that I don't have to take on the wrath of God myself. Isn't that cool? So when Draven believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for him, and when he called on the, uh, the Lord to save him from his sin, repenting of his sin, uh, and turning to Christ by faith, he got saved. And what God told us to do with people who accept Christ as their Savior, who know that heaven's their home, and by the way, if you are saved, you, you can know that heaven's your home. You can know that your sins are forgiven. Is anybody excited about that this morning? And if you're here and you don't know that, we want you to know the only way for you to get uh, to heaven is through Jesus and putting, putting your faith and trust in him. When, when someone gets baptized, what they're doing is identifying with Jesus and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. Not because of the water. Point to who, who, who's, who the reason is, right? It's because of Jesus. And so just as these parents are to dedicate themselves to raising these kids, our church must recognize that baptism is not the finish line in a Christian life. It's the first step of obedience and discipleship. We have a responsibility to help Draven and these dear sweet people that come through the baptistry to help them know what it means to, to follow Christ, to follow the Lord beyond ba baptism, to observe all things that Christ has commanded us. This is the mission's mandate, and the reason why I'm talking about this today is because uh, this month is a month of emphasis for us when it comes to something called missions. Missions, what am I talking about? Well, we're in a series, I'm calling the Send Series, and we're leading up to our Send Conference. Last week we saw in the teaching and preaching of God's Word the biblical pattern for missions that if you weren't here, you can go back and listen to that sermon. You can go to our website and do that. But I'll quickly abbreviate last week what I said. Um, there's, and there's a method to my madness. Last week, and it was too many points. Who agrees? Too many points last week. No critics. I, so I did perfect. Okay, good. I'm glad. Praise the Lord. But he, he, here's the biblical pattern. The biblical pattern of missions in the local church is this. That Jesus Christ was sent on the Father's mission, number one. Jesus Christ was sent on the Father's mission and the Father's authority. Then Jesus sent his disciples on that same mission with Jesus' authority. The disciples then led people to Christ. They baptized people into local churches and discipled them in the context of those local churches. Number four, God, God called people out of those local churches who were discipled and leading in those local churches to go plant churches around the world. These efforts were supported with prayer and giving from other local churches. The church planting missionaries reached people with the gospel. Are you guys excited about our missionaries reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and helping them to know that they can have heaven as their home? That, that's what they do. Then they disciple those people. Then those disciple people go out and plant churches and develop leaders to lead those churches that were planted and then the missionary church planner would report back to the churches that supported the, their efforts and letters and visits. That's what they did in the Bible. And guess what we're doing? We're doing that exact same thing. 
What do we do at Trinity when it comes to worldwide missions? Well, we're, we're doing the Great Commission here. Um, we want people to come to know Christ in Finley. We want people to hear the gospel and believe it and know that they're saved. And then we want to disciple those people and help them to learn how to do everything God called them to. Number two, we support Great Commission ministry through missionaries sent out nationally and internationally. There are people from a bunch of churches and, and hopefully in our church that God is calling, just like they did in, the, in that New Testament time, that early church time, who say, man, God, I feel a burden to go to regions beyond Finley, to go regions beyond Ohio, to go regions beyond America, to go where Christ is not named and to declare him to the nations. And that's why we sang Every week for the last few weeks, God, we have a heart for the nations. We give us the nations. That's what we're trying to do. At our church, we have like 129, I think, right now. Uh, when you walked in today, if you came up uh, hallway number one over here or hallway number two, at the end of those hallways, we updated this week this particular map, and you'll see all of the names being pointed. Those are missionaries um, all over the world that we're supporting monthly to go and start churches all over the world. How cool is that? You guys are not excited. This is amazing, right? That God is letting us, first of all, that God's called all these people to go, to leave America, and to go all over the world to, to make disciples of the nations. There are six additional missionaries serving in creative access nations not shown. So there's people where missionaries aren't allowed to go who have gone in and are starting churches in places like that. And then there's 28 U.S.-based ministries that aren't a part of that thing. But, but my point is, um, we're supporting, like I said, about 129 missionaries all over the world to do this exact thing. And then number three, we're praying. What are we doing? We're praying that God would send someone out of our church to do that same thing. Now, while this pattern is relatively simple and while it's incredibly powerful, it's not without cost. There's a cost to this, isn't there? It costs the people that are called to be missionaries to give their lives to such an incredible mandate. I know a lot of missionaries. They're some of my best friends in the world. And there are very few of them that I know that could not make a whole lot more money doing something else. These people are some of the best, best and brightest. I mixed up those two words. That's not good. Some of the... <laughs> best and brightest people. Let's move on. Amen. We're moving on. Don't miss my point. These are some of the best and brightest people I know. And next week, we're going to have a few of them here. Uh, they're going to be here. We're going to seek to take on more and to support them. And, and so this mandate doesn't just take a few of us. Our mission is taking the gospel of Christ to the nations. It's a gigantic thing. It's a calling that is calling people to leave where, they're, where they are to go to the nations where they have not been to learn la their language and culture as vehicles of the message that is the only hope for the nations. People are giving their lives to this mission of God and to get them there, it takes all of us to be involved. It costs money to, go, to get these people who God is calling to the nations. And so in this area of giving, you're like, oh man, my first Sunday and he's already talking about giving. I don't apologize for this because this isn't about enriching anybody. It's about getting the gospel, the way, the truth, and the life, the message of Jesus to the nations. And so I'm talking today about giving. How can we be involved in this? God has given us an incredible pattern in scripture. And today I want to talk about this pattern of faith. We have been studying the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 11, that's a whole passage about faith. God called Abraham and Sarah to have faith and become the father of a great nation. And he called them to, what's the word? Multiply, right? And, and he did that. God's calling us to have faith, to multiply and to give so that others can go. So what is this pattern of faith related to giving and how is it related to how we give to missions? Well, the pattern and method of giving is what has been called faith promise giving. Maybe you've ever heard that term before. It is how this church, our church, Trinity Baptist Church, has been funding missions for decades, and it's something that you can see in Scripture. It's exemplified in Scripture. So if you have your Bible, Bibles, let's go to, like I said, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. And everyone in our church family can participate 
in worldwide evangelism through giving by understanding the practice and principles of faith, promise, giving. Here are three points that, I, that you need to understand to participate in faith, promise, giving. Number one, faith, promise, giving defined. Let me define it. Let's talk about what it is and give it a good definition. I have a friend who, who went home to be with the Lord named Lauren McAllister. He used to work for the Baptist Bible Fellowship International Mission Office. And he gave this great definition of faith, promise, missions, giving. Here's the definition. It'll be on your screen. Here it is. Faith, promise, missions is a plan for regular, purposeful giving above the tithe to the missionary ministry of our church. A commitment is made for weekly or monthly giving for one year and is renewed at the annual mission conference of the church. Now, Next Sunday is the beginning of our missions conference. We're going to have missionaries here. We're going to have a, a great missionary pastor that's here that's going to help us understand all that. And so while the practice of having a missions commitment card, which we're going to have, and having a special time set aside for worldwide missions as a specific focus is not enumerated in Scripture, the principles that lead us to do this are exemplified in Scripture. We can find these principles and this pattern of giving by faith and giving to missions throughout the scripture. And I want to point you to, the, to a passage today. And incredibly, we find this passage in a letter written from a missionary to a church that he started. So this is a missionary who understands missions, who's writing to this church. It was start this particular church. I, I want you to think about this. Every Bible Every biblical church is started by a local church doing missions and sending a missionary. This church was started in part by Temple Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, who sent out a guy named Gene Milioni to become a missionary to Finley. He didn't know anybody in Finley. In fact, he was going to go somewhere else. And he came to Finley and was like, maybe this is where I need to be. And he ended up staying. That's my understanding. Anybody glad that he did? Amen. I'm really glad that he did. The church was started here because some other church equipped somebody to go beyond where they were. Anybody excited about that? I'm really excited about that. And so what was the pattern of giving by faith that I'm talking about? Well, here's number two. I'm already in point number two. Are you guys excited? Yes. This is awesome. Okay, number two, faith promise giving exemplified. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. This is a guy named Paul who was a missionary writing to the church at Corinth. You'll see several truths about the kind of faith giving, giving by faith, to which he refers and commends. First, we find out about this kind of giving. He's talking about giving, that it's grace giving. It's grace giving. Look at verse number 1. He says this, Moreover, brethren, this is Paul talking to this church, and he calls them brothers. Why are they brothers? They're saved. They both have God as Father and Jesus as God's Son as our big brother who died on the cross for us. So he's talking to his brethren in the Lord. We do you to wit of the grace of God. Do you see it, grace? The grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how then in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Liberality is another word for generosity. He's saying to these guys, hey, I want you to know that we have been helped by the generosity of a whole bunch of churches. Now, Steve, this is the part where you wake up and put the map up, okay? That's a joke. I'm joking. You're not sleeping. Amen. This red line that starts over here, see where it says Syria? If you, say, if you see where it says Syria, say amen. amen. All right. There's a red line coming from a dot. Do you guys see that? Say amen. Okay. Right next to it, it says Antioch. There was a church at Antioch that I talked about last week where the Holy Spirit came to that church and said, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work there unto I have sent them. Okay. So Paul and Barnabas, where was their home church? Okay, let's try it again. Where was their home church? Antioch. That's right. They're at Antioch. And they left from Antioch and they went to Issus and Tarsus and Derby, and they come all the way around. Now, do you see up at the top in the gold, what's the word up there? You see Macedonia say amen. amen. All right. 
Macedonia. Now, what did he say in the verse? I want you to know about the churches in Macedonia. Now, if you look at this map, there's a bunch of churches there. There's Neapolis, there's Philippi. Anybody know about a church in Philippi? In the Bible, if you look in the New Testament, there's a book called the Philippians. And it's Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, right. A pamphlet, Thessalonica. Anybody ever heard of Thessalonica? First and second, Thessalonians, written to Thessalonica. You have Berea. Anybody ever heard of Berea? He says, I want you to be like the Bereans who, who studied the Bible, made sure that what I was telling them was in the Bible, right? So these are all churches in Macedonia. Now, do you see below, it's actually green. I don't know if you can tell if it's green or not, but there's a big letter that says Achaia. You guys see that? And right above Achaia, there's a little dot, and it says the word Corinth. What's the letter we're reading? This is the second letter to the Corinthians. What Paul's saying is, hey, I want you to know, I've been traveling. I've been traveling some to new places where I'm starting churches. I've also been traveling, this is what he could say, he didn't say this, but this is what he could say. I've also been traveling to some places where I've already started churches. And when I saw those churches, in Macedonia, I want you to know what happened. Back to verse one. I, wanted, I want you to know about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So who did this? Was it the churches in Macedonia? It, it, it was. But who was the one working through them? God. This is the grace of God. What's grace? Unmerited favor. They, they were used of God, verse 2, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Do these people have a lot? They did not have a lot. They had very little. So you have deep poverty, but then he says this, abounded. You know what abounded means? What does abound mean? Abound means overflowing. Anybody else? Anybody ever go to an ice cream shop? You ever get like a really conservative person at an ice cream shop? Right? And they're like, here's your little scoop. That'll be 1733. I'm like looking for the chubby guy to scoop me ice cream. Who's with me? I want the, I want the big scoop. You could tell. I want the big scoop. Right? Abundance. I want my scoop overflowing. If it's flowing down onto my hand, I do not care. Because I could have just a little bit. He's saying this, there's abundance. And what he's saying here is, hey, they're in a great trial of fiction, but they have an abundance of joy. They have deep poverty, but this abounded into the riches of their liberality or their generosity, Right? It was a grace of God in them, and there's this abundance. But then who is it empowered by? I want you to see that this giving was empowered by the Lord. Look at verses 3 to 5. Here's what it says. For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You know what he's saying? They were trying to give us, and in giving, they were saying, please take this. You need it to do your ministry. The people that you're going to down in Corinth, remember the map, they need what we can give. So I want you to go down and take this gift that we have, and the gift, it says, was to their power, meaning they gave out of what they had, but they even say, it says here that they gave beyond what they have. That's what we call the grace of God here. They had faith beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship and the ministering of the saints, verse five. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. You know what he's saying? Paul's saying it was kind of painful to watch people in deep poverty be that generous. They were given everything they had. And we were concerned from them, but what we recognize is that this kind of giving was of the will of God. And it was empowered by the Lord. They, 
God is able to take care of us. That's what's going on here. We also see that it's encouraged by example. Look at verse 6. It says, In so much that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. He's saying, This is what we want Titus to do. Titus is there with you. And we want him to encourage you to do the same thing that these Macedonians are doing. So that he would finish also in you the same grace also. The same kind of giving also. Therefore, he says, so with this example in mind, church at Corinth, this example of the Macedonians and the grace of God what he's doing and allowing them to be liberal and give and supply their need and for them to depend on God by faith to supply their need because they've given. Verse seven, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence. Hey, because you know Jesus as your savior, you've been given a lot. That's what he's saying. Have the Corinthians been given a lot? You go back and read, they weren't saved and now they're saved. They weren't living for the Lord and now God's using them and changing them and growing them and they have a ministry. And he's saying, God's given you all these other ministries. Don't forget this ministry, the ministry of generosity, the ministry of giving to the mission of God by faith. He says, verse seven, you you abound in everything, faith, utterance, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace, this generosity, this giving also. We see about this giving also that it's motivated by love. Look at verse 8. He says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. What is he saying? He's saying, don't do this out of duty. I'm not commanding you to give. I'm using the occasion of the example of other people. And you say that you love, you say that you love God, you say that you love God's people. I want you to give out of that love. Folks, our giving should not stop at at duty. The motivation for our giving ought not to be, and this is any giving, not just giving to missions. Our giving ought to be, man, God has given so much to us. He's given so much to me, and I love him so much. And, and, and he is doing something great, and it's all his anyway. I'm going to give because I love him and because I love what God wants to do in others. So it's motivated by love. Here's another one. This is a big one. Verse 9. It's exemplified by Jesus. I love this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, um, how was Jesus doing in heaven before he came? Who agrees he's doing pretty good? You know, no, Jesus didn't start at Christmas. He existed before that. You guys know that? And in heaven, is anybody questioning if Jesus is God's son in heaven? You guys don't know? Let let me tell you. No one's questioning. He is rightly identified in heaven. But what happened? Where was Jesus born? He was born in a stable. He was born, shepherds arrived to commemorate what was going on. Are 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 you with me? Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became Poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. When you give, by definition, you have less when you give. Right? If, if you didn't lose out on anything, everybody would be given. But not everybody gives. He says, I want you to think about Jesus Jesus is the ultimate giver. The best gift that was ever given was Jesus. And Jesus gave his life. He laid down his life as a ransom for many. The Bible says he he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And what I want you to know is that if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, God gave his best 
for you so that you could have eternal life. This kind of giving is exemplified by Jesus. And then this kind of giving, this faith giving is a promise made and a promise fulfilled. Look at verse 10. And herein I give my advice. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. For this is expedient for you who have begun before. You've, you've offered to give before. You've made promises to give before is what he's telling them. Not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it. Do what you said. Do what you committed yourself to do. That is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. You know what Paul's saying? Make the promise and keep it. Now, we could do a whole lot more study in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and you guys want to go to lunch, and I get that. So that's why I'm going to move on to point number three. This giving that he's commending, I want you to see one last thing, that this giving, it was for missions. It was for missions. This is where we read, Brother Bill read this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So just move a couple pages over. Look at verse 14. When Paul's saying we, it's because he has an entourage of guys, other missionaries that are going with him. This is something he did. And he was planning on coming to Corinth. And so he says in verse 14, talking about their giving and, their, and the Corinthians giving and their mission. Verse 14, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. What was Paul doing? He's preaching the good news, the gospel. Christ's death for our sins according to the scriptures, burial, resurrection for our sin according to the scriptures. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors. He's, like, he's, he's saying, I'm not pretending to have worked in I'm, taking, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking credit for what other people have done. I'm telling you about what we're doing. I'm having hope, he says in verse 15. When your faith is increased, what is he talking about? When you depend on God more in doing something, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. He's saying, I'm hoping that when you give to us, that we'll be more enabled to do something because you've depended on God to give to us. Why? Verse 16. Here it is. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. What was the giving for? To preach the gospel in regions beyond you. Steve, I've mentioned you now twice in the message. Can you go back to that blue map? The blue map. I know it's hard to see, but do you see little lines with other lines, lines of text with lines pointing to little dots making up the map? Do you see those lines? Do you see the lines of, of, of written? Every line that you see is a family. Every line, I'm looking up there, I see Thornton, Radabaugh, Solomon and Bravo, Wilson, Siegbert, Maldoff, Gocher, Hayes, Nisley, Long, Faldi, Fritz, Woodworth, Kennedy, Tabor, Pratt. These are all families that didn't start out at the, in the arrow, in the place. They, they didn't start where they are. Almost every single person, every line on there started somewhere in the United States. Somebody say awesome. They aren't living here anymore. Where are they at? Well, they're in Kenya, in Australia. Some are in Europe. Some are in Greece. Some are in South America and Central America. Some are in the Philippines. Some are, some, are, some are in places I dare not say because if I said it, I might reveal that they're in places that governments think they ought not be. Why? Because there's people there that don't have the gospel. 
that if they were to die without the gospel, would send, spend eternity separated from God forever. And what I want to tell you is, I have exciting news. Next week, three people who are willing to do that will be here in our services just for a short time, representing another 126 people who are willing to do that. That's pretty cool. And they're willing to take this message of the gospel where we can't go. And so what Paul's asking the Macedonians is, hey, I want you to help us by giving so that the people who are willing to go to regions beyond you will go to regions beyond you. Why? To give the gospel where it's not named. If people die without hearing and responding to the gospel, what happens? I'm telling you, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The Bible says, there is no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is one mediator the man Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The nations must hear and must respond to the gospel. And Christianity is propositional. We can't make anybody saved. We can't make anybody a Christian. That's not how this works. It happens by proposing the gospel and allowing the Holy Spirit to work and having people respond to it. He says here that this giving, what is it about? It's about supporting people to preach the gospel and the reasons beyond you, not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to, to our hand, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, for not that he committeth himself is approved, but he whom the Lord commendeth. <coughs> We started the services today with a baptism and with a baby dedication. And I started the sermon today talking about baby dedication. In the scriptures, a woman named Hannah who didn't have a child asked for a child. And made, she made a promise to God. She said, God, if you give me a child, what I'll do is I'll take what you've given me and I'll give them back to you. I have the faith to ask. And I'm making a promise that if you give me, I'll give him back. That's faith promise giving. That's asking God and believing in God to provide so that you can give. <clears throat> it's not magic. This is the essence of faith promise giving. We're asking God to supply so that we can go. We're making a promise to the Lord individually that if he would give to us that, that we would give to the evangelism of the nations. That's what it looks like on the individual level. So what I want us to begin to pray about this week and as we head into our missions conference is this. God would you give me the faith to believe that you would give me something that I could give? Not so, that I would be in, uh, not so that I would be enlarged, but so that missionaries who are taking the gospel would be enlarged and be effective. So that's what we're doing. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to take a, a commitment and say, hey, ask God what he would have you to give over and above your tithes and offerings to the missions of his efforts of our church. But I want you to think one step beyond that today. It's also what we're praying as a church for, right? We're praying that God, have you prayed about this? I hope you have. If you haven't, please pray. We're asking that God would give us someone that we could reach maybe, that we could train and disciple, not so that they would stay here, but so that they could be sent 
to regions beyond. We're asking God and we're saying, God, if you give us someone like that and you'd work in their heart to go to regions beyond, we'd be willing to give them up. And we hope that they would be a first one in a long line of other people that maybe, God, you would raise up here and that we could keep sending and you keep providing and we'll keep sending them. Sometimes we're sending them here in Ohio and sometimes we're sending them beyond Ohio to the nations. Do you get it? That's what we're asking to do. And so, the church at Antioch gave their best. Paul and Barnabas. Other than Jesus, this is the world's, the world's greatest missionary and his mentor. And they sent them out. And so doing, the gospel got to us. And so doing, the gospel will get to the nations. We will have the faith to believe that God would supply. Will we have the faith to believe that God would supply so that we can give and so that someone could go? Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes with me this morning.